Evening everybody, great to be with you again uh, tonight as we continue through this uh, wonderful book of Revelation as the Moravian Daily Readings are leading us. And the text for today is the remainder of chapter 2 from verses 12 to 29. So um, continuing this um, sense of uh, the uh, having the two um, churches um, back to back, same as, same as yesterday. Um, so um, what you're going to get the sense of um, increasingly, um, even through these letters before, is, I mean, you kind of have this kind of strange idea sometimes, don't we, um, that this is kind of all prologue, as it were, preamble, and that like the real kind of revelation is going to start after these letters, um, but really n not so at all. Um, and, and what we're gaining, actually, in these letters, a number of things, um, comfort and correction, as we said previously, but we're also gaining um, a bit of an insight into just how incredibly this book is written. Um, it's densely plotted. It's um, hugely well referenced. Clearly, you know, not only is it inspired by God himself, but is um, birthed out of the, the authorship of somebody who is immersed in the Old Testament texts and in the person and work of Jesus, the words of Jesus, faithfulness to the love of Christ. Um, it's just pretty stunning. Um, so, uh, you know, time won't permit us to really kind of consider every facet or aspect of, of these little portions, but read it for yourself multiple times. I know, I think yesterday, did I recommend that you get a study Bible? I'm going to recommend it again. Um, I, I, did, I did say that commentaries might prove a little um, prohibitively expensive, but if you did want to get a commentary and, and you'd like to kind of um, really dig into things, can I recommend um, Ian Paul's commentary? It's in the Tyndale um, New Testament uh, commentary series. It's really very good. If you want something that um, it's perhaps it's got loads of information, it's very helpful, but is a little bit more devotional, um, a, a vicar um, named Simon Ponsonby, I think that's right. I think so. Um, has written a book called And the Lamb Wins. Um, and it's just so rich. It's so encouraging, uh, but really insightful as well. So, you know, if you are looking to go a bit deeper, um, those are two ways you might want to go. Um, right. Let's look at some of the detail um, before we come back to perhaps the central point. So, again, you know, we've mentioned that some of the churches get correction and. Um, comfort um, and and that's what we have here um, with Pergamum and Thyatira um, Thyatira um, John recounts these words of the Son of God and we, we said already every one of these mini letters is um, is coming from Christ himself referencing um, things that we've seen in chapter 1 that vision of, of Jesus um, Thyatira, the word comes, I know your works, your love and faith and service and patient endurance. Your latter works exceed the first. It's pretty fantastic. Pergamum, if we go back, um, you hold fast my name and you did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. Again, really good stuff. So they've got the comfort, the encouragement. Um, there is correction as well. I'll come to that in a moment. Um, what are we seeing here? Um, well, some really wonderful stuff. Um, talking of Antipas there, um, he was killed among you where Satan dwells. Um, Pergamum is, is said to be where Satan's throne is. Pergamum was a major centre of Roman uh, pagan worship. Big Zeus uh, worshipping centre. Um, Augustus the Emperor, the goddess Roma, uh, Asclepios, um, the god of healing, um, is symbolised by serpents. Um, all of this, I think, plays into the idea of it being a place where the throne of of, um, of Satan is. Um, and there it is that Antipas is martyred, faithfully um, sticking to the true gospel. And note here, um, he's described as my faithful witness. My faithful witness, that's language that John has previously used um, specifically um, to describe Jesus. Um, chapter 1, verse 5. Um, 
So that, that perseverance in terms of the point of martyrdom actually identifies him more fully uh, with Christ, um, which is really, really cool. Um, continuing with the idea of um, the, the encouragement, um, every letter finishes with this, to him who overcomes or to him who keeps faithful to the end, to him who conquers, that kind of stuff. Um, what do we have um, for Pergamum? Hidden manna, uh, the, the, this, this bread of life. Uh, but this white stone, uh, a white stone would be given to someone who was victorious at um, Roman games and it would entitle them entry um, to a, an after games banquet. That's going to come quite interesting, isn't it? When John then starts to unpack this idea of um, the the um, the, uh, the the feast um, with Jesus um, when he returns and receives his his people to himself. Um, so there's really kind of interesting kind of stuff coming together, and a new name um, written upon it. Um, which is, you know, how we newly are in Christ Jesus. Um, continuing with the encouragement to Thyatira, there we have um, this sense of being given um, the morning star. Um, and the morning star is, is none other than Christ himself. That, that you know, if, if we conquer and keep his works to the end, then yes, the stuff about authority over the nations and, and all, ruling and authority and all that kind of stuff, but better yet is to receive the morning star. Now, interestingly, um, to the church in Pergamum, he's, we're going to come to the correction in a moment, uh, but he's highlighted the teaching of Balaam, son of Balak. Um, and um, if you were to have a look at that in Numbers 24, you would see that Balaam um, was actually, he actually foresaw the morning star. Um, in in his uh, in in his prophecy, even though he didn't, even though he wanted to serve the enemies of Israel, um, he was forced to serve God's purposes. And you just feel how John is weaving these things together. He's referenced Balaam to the church in Pergamum, here the morning star to the church in Thyatira. This is just richly um, full of, of scripture and understanding. Now, you know, having said that, let's just. Um, address uh, the corrective words that are coming to the churches here uh, because you know it, it's all well and good to receive encouragement and comfort and think right I'm fine I'm done I'm dusted um, that way is lies complacency uh, which leads to faithlessness um, which leads to judgment um, there's a lot of reference to Satan um, in these letters, perhaps more than perhaps you've been used to so far through the, the New Testament, even just in these few passages. We have the synagogue of Satan um, uh, to the church in Smyrna. Here we've got uh, Satan's throne and um, where Satan dwells in Pergamum. And then to Thyatira, um, there's some who are pursuing the, what they call the deep things of Satan. Satan uh, being another name for the devil, of course. The, the, the Hebrew language is Hasatan, the accuser, um, the accuser of the brethren, which is going to become quite pertinent when we move through Revelation and how it is that, that the people have got to overcome him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. Um, now, um, so there's this, this dynamic of spiritually battling against um, the powers of darkness and evil and of the devil himself, um, but the battle belonging to God. He is the victor, of course, and our faithfulness to Christ is the means by which his victory um, becomes our lived reality uh, and how we then operate within this world. We can't fight against darkness in our own strength. But when we're faithful to the light of life, to Christ himself, then his victory is realised in our lives and, and through us. Um, what's the big issue for these two churches? Well, um, there's false teaching. We've mentioned already the teaching of Balaam is there in Pergamum. And another reference to the Nicolaitans, um, which was an issue for the church in Ephesus as well. Um, and then with Thyatira, um, there's this false prophetess, um, Jezebel, 
Um, with both, there's issues of food sacrifice to idols. There's also issues, uh, significant issues, it seems, with sexual immorality and the tolerance of these things. Now, just the fact of calling things sexual immorality is unusual within the culture. And we know uh, within uh, the Roman pagan worship in a number of uh, the different cults of the of the gods and goddesses and uh, you know the different kinds of worship there were um sexual elements indeed sex and its use and abuse was central um to worship within some of these um temple cultic practices um it wasn't considered immorality it wasn't considered odd or, or aberrant in any kind of way um really anything went so the very fact that there is something called out as immorality is countercultural, but then there's a call yet further not simply to name it for what it is, but to abstain from it, indeed abhor it, and reject it entirely, and cleanse the church from these things. This is massively countercultural. It's deeply rooted in the Jewish um, sexual ethic, uh, which we have from the Old Testament, and, and John obviously is from that. Um, from that religious culture um, but it's affirmed and indeed extended through the Christians um, and this was one of the primary reasons in fact um, why they stood out so differently within that culture um, and then why they receive a persecution the major issues are that they wouldn't worship the Emperor which was hugely encouraged only Jesus was Lord for the Christian which is a big issue for your average Emperor um, but rejection of the of the other uh, Roman uh, pagan uh, teachings um, that the Romans were quite content to add another god to their pantheon but um, for, for this um, Jesus to exclude all other gods was a major issue uh, the sexual ethic was a, a major distinctive um, for the Christians this idea that one man is married to one woman and that being the only place um, for sex which is for their mutual benefit their encouragement and for the procreation of children so they might be raised up within that family um, I think it's always been the case throughout Christian history that the Christian sexual ethic has been counter to the culture um, one way or another and, and nothing has changed today there are many other sexual ethics um, within our world things that the Bible would call immorality that our culture calls normal and perfectly acceptable. And there's a clash of ideals, a clash of worldviews. Uh, and these clashes sometimes can get heated, fraught, sometimes can even um, you know, lead to um, court cases or exclusions from the public sphere. Um, I suppose as Christians we have to ask ourselves two things. One, are we communicating well? Are we communicating what the scriptures teach uh, nothing less and indeed nothing more. And are we communicating that not solely with our words but with our lives? Do we demonstrate the benefit of the Christian sexual ethic? Do we demonstrate the value of uh, the biblical view of uh, marital relations, of, of families and so on and so forth? Um, you know, it, are our lives as good as our words? Um, and then secondarily, um, not are we kind of just you know speaking that or or kind of uh, just living it but but are we faithful to that um, even in the face of opposition the opposition of ideas sometimes the opposite opposition of, of, of folks who don't understand or maybe resent um, what we might teach or live are we faithful um, Antipas gained the very title of Christ because of his faithfulness to the end the Pergamum Church was going to receive entrance um, to the marriage supper of the Lamb um, and this name that is given to them by Christ. The Thyatiran church was going to receive authority in judgment and rule, but moreover, receiving Christ himself. I suppose you've got to ask yourself, what do you want? Do you want the, you know, the momentary um, seeming satisfactions of this age? which never really satisfy and truly just lie or do you want christ and all that he offers his true and lasting satisfaction 
but sex is a big area for thinking about these things. Who is Lord? You know, for those early Christians, they declared Jesus was Lord and they declared it through their attitudes to sex. Um, how about you and me? Um, how are we living? Um, you know, do we hold up to these standards? Are, are we um, living according to a, a, a biblical sexual morality or, or not? Um, you know, the, the, the choice is obvious. Um, the, the call to, to repentance or, or to judgment is obvious. The promise of Christ is glorious. Um, far transcends anything else. Shall we pray? Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you, our morning star, that you have risen in all your glory and you shine uh, with all of your beauty and your blessing upon us. Um, Lord Jesus, uh, we know when we reflect upon who you are and what you have done that we, we really can want for nothing other than you. But this world does lie to us and uh, Satan is an accuser um, and we are often distracted or weak um, and we ask for your help, God, that we would remain faithful, that God, we would allow for your victory to be realised in our lives, that we would speak lives that are both faithful to you and indeed call those around us to a better way. Um, Lord Jesus Christ, we ask that you would help us in these things. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, well, there you go. Um, it's, it is always interesting to kind of reference sex, um, you know, in this kind of environment. I have no idea who's listening or what you might think about that. But look, if you did want to get in touch with us and ask a little bit more query things, then you're more than welcome to do so, as always. Um, and, uh, and we do pray God's blessing on your lives. I'll see you again next time. Good night.